Brisbane, from Brisbane, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Marcus Montigl. I am the president of the IRSC. I also uh, welcome our participants on the live stream, and it's a great uh, uh, feeling to have you all with us here in Brisbane. The title of the paper uh, this afternoon is Human Factors in Cockpits, Lessons Learned in the Light of ATO. And uh, I knew this title already one and a half years ago, and of course I couldn't know that, uh, which sad actuality this paper would have today in the light of the recent events. However, it is the duty of all engineers, no matter which discipline they work in, uh, to learn from also from their mistakes and to do a better job in the future. And, all, and so I'm sure we can learn a lot uh, this afternoon from our speaker. Now I have to uh, add that actually I was looking for, uh, for more than one year for a speaker for this paper. It was very hard, there were some candidates, but uh, for one or other reason no, none uh, worked out until at the CBTC conference in Toronto, organized also by the IRSC, I met Michael, I had lunch with him, and I immediately knew he would be his man, my man. And uh, once you have heard his uh, biography, uh, you will certainly agree with me. Mr. McNa McNamara started his career in railway signaling, learning signal circuit design in the Signal Design Center of the Penn Central Railroad in Philadelphia in 1973, which later became Conrail. At that time, signal design was performed across uh, 17 states and two Canadian provinces for both passenger and freight lines, both electrified and non-electrified. Later, he worked at the series of engineering firms designing signaling and other systems for mostly electrified passenger railways. In, and in 2003, he joined his current employer, Gannett Fleming, to lead the Gannett Fleming Transit and Rail Systems Division. He has acted as project manager and later as principal oversight on signaling and train control projects across most major passenger railways and in the US and a few in Canada. And now in, it comes in aviation he started flight lessons in 1991 and bought his airplane in 1995, which he still owns. He has traveled in that airplane all across the US, Canada, and even to Mexico. He holds the airline transport pilot certificate, the highest pilot rating in aviation. He is also a flight instructor. He is a professional engineer in 13 U US states plus Ontario, Canada, and since a few weeks, he is also a proud fellow of IRSC. Please welcome Mr. Michael McNamara. Thank you, Marcus. That was a very uh, nice introduction. The, it is interesting to be sitting here, giving a, standing here, giving a talk on human factors in aviation uh, in light of recent events with uh, Boeing aircraft, but uh, which I'm following quite, uh, quite closely. To know where we are today, we have to know our history. The railways uh, have been around for a long time, but continuous cab signaling uh, developed uh, in the 1930s in the U.S. Uh, is the basis for modern uh, ATO. 
it became in widespread use across the U.S. Uh, in the 1960s. Our 100 hertz uh, carrier systems is, uh, it was first developed uh, on the major freight railways at the insistence of the U.S. government. Uh, audio frequencies became more popular later on in rail transit passenger systems, metros. Today we have CBTC and in the U.S. positive train control, which is mandated by uh, U.S. Congress. The systems are more vehicle-centric than wayside. Train determination, train, de train position is determined by, uh, in some cases, U.S., or uh, in some cases, GPS, but in other places, uh, by wheel rotation and uh, transponders. GPS doesn't work in uh, underground stations and systems. For that reason, many of the uh, passenger railways that go underground uh, are using variations of PTC that do not use GPS, whereas the freight railroads that operate across the U.S. are primarily using uh, GPS. Aviation history in parallel. Early autopilots stated back, believe it or not, to 1912, which was only <clears throat> 10 years after aviation started. Advances, like everything, uh, were in aviation were made in World War II. Bill Lear was an early developer both of Lear jets and autopilots. <clears throat> jet airplanes and autopilots are a happy marriage because at the high altitudes that jet airplanes fly at, uh, they are very difficult to hand fly, and I've tried it myself. The, uh, so autopilots are required to fly at 40,000 feet. <clears throat> Before GPS, which started out, what, in the 1990s, uh, we had INS, inertial navigation systems, being used for, uh, started out for crossing oceans, uh, and later used across land masses. And of course, space travel to the moon, which uh, was developed in the 1960s, uh, relied on uh, autopilots. Autopilots are fair, started out being fairly complicated, as you can see in this picture. That's a typical uh, small airplane uh, autopilot system. Perspective. Railways are a mature technology. 150 years of progress. Aviation was a crazy experiment until uh, about 80 years ago. And it really wasn't reliable transportation until after World War II. Aviation uh, has experienced rapid techno technological change. Where railways, in my opinion, develop uh, change at a more measured pace, although the pace of change in both areas has been increasing rapidly. Again, a little perspective. Uh, Aviation, uh, three dimensions, is inherently more complex. Ask anybody that ever tried to land an airplane and they uh, will understand that. You have to uh, control the airplane both laterally, vertically, <clears throat> and airspeed. The, uh, but railways have their own hazards. No train can swerve to avoid an accident. We all know as railway signal engineers that uh, trains can't stop in the distance they can see, and that creates inherent risks. Man-machine interface and uh, human factors. The early railway systems used overspeed control while manual driving. The motorman has control and is attentive. Motorman stays proficient. Station stopping uh, adds to his own proficiency. But this creates problems. Modern railway systems use uh, ATO and the motorman loses proficiency. But headways are more uniform. I'll tell you a little story. There's a passenger railway that I commuted on uh, every day back uh, in the 19, maybe 70s, 80s. The, it still exists today. It was designed by my company long before I went there. I went in service in 1968. It has ATO in the normal direction only. And they knew that there was a concern about the motorman losing proficiency. So they decided that every day the motorman would make one round trip under manual control. So there's a couple issues with this. One is that when he did that every day, <clears throat> he had pretty much 
full speed, uh, speed commands, and, and he would slow down the same places. He slowed down every other day and every other trip. Then, after 25 years, the rail was wearing out, and they had to single track to work on the rail. And there was no ATO in reverse direction. And they had very many close calls because the operators were not very good at operating the trains across the turnouts. They had trouble controlling their speed. Station stopping was always sloppy. And most importantly, they had a few close calls slowing down for the second turnout to get back onto the normal direction. Because of that, they created a program, which I was project engineer on, to install reverse ATO. And it was very expensive and uh, very disruptive to the operation. A simulator to, to simulate that would have been a better choice. The, uh, and I'll get into that in a minute. The other main machine interface issues are that uh, failures are not often well understood by the operators. In railway cab signaling, we've uh, often heard of stories where uh, a train comes to a stop in cab signaling with speed control, and uh, maybe it's because of a broken wire, and then uh, it happens maybe a month later or six months later, and, and, uh, and the operator takes over manual control, and then the uh, one day uh, he comes to a stop again and he says, oh, this happened again, and he bypasses it and he goes into manual control and goes around a curve and there's a train on the tracks. It's because uh, of an incorrect uh, assumption about what's really going on. Aircraft autopilot modes uh, are complicated and confusing for different reasons. The, uh, I don't know why they're so complicated. Sometimes I think that people just, engineers like to design complicated things, but it gives the accomplished pilot lots of flexibility, but you can't design an airplane for the most accomplished pilot. Less accomplished pilots suffer, and even one pilot that doesn't understand what his airplane is doing uh, can be a very big hazard. <clears throat> The, uh, in, in this example, where, uh, which I was just talking about, the, where the operator lost, lost proficiency, uh, the, uh, he was actually unable to control the train when required. Aircraft autopilots can disconnect without pilot awareness, and that's a hazard, especially with, uh, with two pilots. Each one can think the other one's doing it. Trim, <clears throat> which maybe is something that's not often understood by non-pilots, but maybe you're all reading about it in the New York Times these days, uh, can, can be uh, an insidious uh, problem in, in not understanding uh, the aircraft. And uh, many cockpit voice recorders, the last words were, uh, what is it doing now? Autopilot thinking in the aviation business has changed when they first became widespread and uh, they could control all the different modes, the climb, the cruise, the level off of different attitudes. Uh, the FAA encouraged pilots to just let George do it. George is the nickname for the autopilot. He, they figured he's more proficient than the, than the pilot is anyway. He does a better job. He doesn't make mistakes. <clears throat> but what they found out is that when George stopped working, that uh, things didn't go well. Now pilots are encouraged to hand fly part-time. And even in an airline today, most pilots will uh, take off and climb manually until they get to the higher altitudes and then just start pushing buttons. Both aircraft and trains require operators at some time to do some manual operation, and, and, and that's important. Lack of proficiency does not have self-awareness. As a flight instructor, uh, I uh, do uh, proficiency checkups on, on other pilots, and uh, my airplane doesn't even really have a full function in autopilot because I really don't trust them, but uh, most people that have airplanes like mine and they travel in them, they think uh, autopilot is a mandatory part of their uh, airplane. And uh, so, uh, <clears throat> but most pilots, uh, if you ask them, well, can you go up and shoot that instrument approach? They, uh, well, of course, I was trained in it. And I, I got certified just three years ago. Of course, I can still do it. And then uh, they're surprised when they can't because uh, if you don't do something all the time, you can lose proficiency very quickly. For that reason, the airlines require 
uh, their pilots to go through uh, proficiency checkups uh, every six months, nine months, 12 months. It depends on how much experience you have. Pilot training is uh, very extensive and lasts many years. It's rigidly regulated and controlled. Applicants can flunk out. They use very sophisticated full motion simulators and very expensive. In this picture here, this is a simulator and we see two pilots up front. The left seat is the captain and, and the right seat is the co-pilot and they do train uh, as a two-pilot operation and they switch seats and then they do the next training session. This guy you see sitting in the back with his computer, he's uh, noticed that he has a computer screen and he can fail an engine and, and create different weather scenarios. But notice he has a pen in his hand and he's marking on a sheet because the, uh, he's grading these pilots and, and the grades are, are, are permanent records. And, and if those pilots uh, don't pass the grade, they're gonna flunk out and they're gonna lose their livelihood. So uh, a lot of attention is, is uh, applied to this. Uh, pilot training centers on things that rarely happen. Uh, uh, when you get into a simulator, or even when you get into a small airplane, which is actually cheaper to run than a simulator, the, you don't say, well, let's see if you can take off. If somebody's flying the line in an airline, you're not going to say, well, I wonder if you can land the airplane. Well, he's been landing it every day. The, but what they're going to do, they're going to fail an engine. <clears throat> a pilot and an airliner might go his whole life without ever having an engine fail, but every simulator session he ever was at, an engine failed. And, and that's why we use simulators. In other words, the important thing is that we are simulating things that rarely happen. Railway operator training <clears throat> is not so good. It's not often regulated. It's more casual, it's not standardized. Training extent varies, <clears throat> and the railway simulators that I've seen are not impressive. The, instead of having that guy say, run this train manually once a day, it would be better to put him in a simulator and have him say, yeah, there's a train stuck on the track, you're gonna go over the switch reverse, <clears throat> and then you have to operate on the other track manually, slowing down for curves manually. And when you get to the other turn out, the other interlock and to go back, you have to make sure that you slow down for that to go back. It would be much better to put that into a sim simulator. And when he's on the line driving the train every day, he can leave it in ATO, which is a better, smoother operation anyway. That's a lesson that we could learn in railways from aviation. <clears throat> railways could could use this training and should use this training, in my opinion, on a regular basis. Every six months, these guys should go through the training, especially if there are scenarios that they're not familiar with. It is uh, legal on most, uh, an accepted practice on most railways to disconnect part of the brakes on the train, typically by truck, uh, which is one half the brakes of a car, and still dispatch the train. It was a problem with the brakes. The, uh, and we take that into account when we <clears throat> design at our 30% safety factor to our safe braking distances. But we never train our operators what it's gonna be like to drive that train manually with part of the brakes cut out. And uh, these types of scenarios could, could and should be uh, developed and installed in uh, simulators. Hazards and failure modes, a comparison. Railway signaling fails, it stops the train. Aircraft autopilots fail, <clears throat> they turn it off but let the aircraft keep going. The, uh, in some cases the pilot might not even know it clicked off. In fact, most autopilots, uh, if turbulence gets too bad, for example, it, it'll click off, it says I don't know what to do, click. and and, uh, and, and many of them have a, a loud warning buzzer and maybe a light, beep, autopilot's off. The, uh, uh, 
Uh, and the loud buzzer is the wake the pilot up because he could be half asleep. <clears throat> Hazards and failure modes pre-departure testing. The similarities are, are, are actually very interesting. Both uh, have uh, pre-departure tests, pre-takeoff checklists. They both do the same thing. <clears throat> I've been on many flights when they said, uh, your airplane's broke, we're canceling the flight. <clears throat> the, uh, say you're stuck until they figure out where to get another airplane. I've ridden lots of trains. I've never been on a train that was canceled due to a pre-departure testing. I was on, on the Long Island Railroad one time and I was talking to them about uh, their cab signal and speed control system. And they had somebody from Uniswitch and Signal, now in Saldo, there that was helping to oversee uh, their operation. And, and, and they told me that, on, that they were replacing the, the whole fleet of trains. They said on the old fleet, they used to have an average of 400 cab signal fares a, a day. And I'm like, 400 per day? <clears throat> they certainly didn't cancel the trains. The, uh, <clears throat> both types of vehicles are, are left outside with weather extremes. And I mentioned this to somebody and they said, well, it's not really outside, it's inside this, 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 this vehicle. But the uh, weather extremes, condensation, uh, rapid changes in humidity, uh, all these have a lot of effect on, on uh, electrical contacts and, and, and uh, electronics. Railways do have more shock and vibration, but avionics have to work even with explosive decompression at high altitudes and more severe temperatures. So they both have differences, but they both are very strict in their uh, environmental considerations. When one learns, when one owns an aircraft, he learns about aircraft maintenance. Uh, that's uh, myself and my wife, and that's my airplane. The, uh, for smaller aircraft, annual inspection, uh, once a year, they take my airplane apart, or at least take all the inspection covers off. Uh, uh, if it's for hire, meaning flight training usually every 100 hours, uh, two years, the, the altimeter and transponder are tested. Certain items are required by airworthiness directives. If, uh, if there's a pattern of some, some dangerous failure, like happened in, on, on a 737, you're, you're going to see an airworthiness directive issued, and it has the force of law. It's not just an advice by, by the manufacturer, but it, it is a, a law. And uh, the aircraft are uh, pre-flighted, and so are trains. Maintenance logs are kept. I have a book of uh, logs this high for my airplane since inception, since it was built in 1965. I don't know if, if uh, logs uh, are equipped, kept that way for all the trains and all the railways, but I suspect, uh, suspect not. Certainly it's not required by law the way it is in aircraft. Large aircraft uh, have a a little different because they're complicated. They have a progressive maintenance program, uh, uh, H checks, B checks, C checks. Every three months you got to do this. Every thousand hours you got to do that. Uh, and on those systems, major components are replaced by hours, cycles, and years. We don't see that so much in aviation or in railways. Uh, but in aviation, <clears throat> the avionics maybe was automatically replaced every 20 years, maybe the control head for the navigation system, or maybe some sensors, maybe every one year or five years. We don't see the requirements for that uh, so structured in railways. I think we could learn from it. In maintenance, railways are different from airlines, <clears throat> and, but yet increasingly they use some of the same systems and processes. U.S. differs from Europe, U.S. Federal Railway Administration regulates some uh, railways, mostly the freight and inner city passenger railways, but not most public transit, not any of the metro or light rail systems. ARIMA, it's an American system that has standards. There's still a culture in the U.S. that 
railway signal systems uh, want to last forever, and everybody is complaining about the fact that, uh, geez, this electronic thing only lasts 20 years. Uh, but aviation has uh, learned long ago that you have to have a path forward. Aviation developed after World War II, that's a long time ago, they developed standards called form, fit, function, that all of the boxes that go into a, an aircraft panel have to have a certain specification for its size and its fit and how it interfaces so that you can pull it out and put in a new technology. Railways, not so much. <clears throat> ATO operates 20 hours a day, left out in the weather, and it's typically maintained as part of an overall vehicle maintenance program. The train control engineers don't even have a say because oftentimes that's like, well, that's the vehicle guys. We don't talk to them. And uh, that stuff can't last forever. There should be uh, a, a mandated structured maintenance program. <clears throat> parts, aircraft parts are required to have PMA parts manufacturing authority. If I want to buy a part for my airplane, uh, of course, you'd go to the manufacturer first, but the manufacturer's going to say, well, we built your airplane in 1965. You know, we don't sell all those parts. You know? But there's a lot of airplanes uh, that are very similar to mine. The manufacturer has turned out 50,000 uh, airplanes like mine. Most of them are still in service. So there are follow-on companies that say, yeah, Beechcraft, sure, they'll sell you a part, but they'll charge you a fortune. But we can sell you that, that part. And, uh, but the FAA requires that company that makes that part to have parts manufacturing authority, it requires quality control, and they'll come and look at the, your capabilities and, and your manufacturing site. Whereas in railways, anybody can make parts. BART in San Francisco, it's a uh, ATO system. Uh, and it's been in service since the 1960s, and I was out there recently, and the company, uh, which I won't mention, that made the uh, original train control system was bought and acquired, and things changed, and they no longer support it. And uh, they were contracting with some little local company to make circuit boards to put in their train control system. And what the safety certification is for that is, well, there is none. So there really should be a better attention to, well, who gives that company the authority to sell those safety critical parts? And that really should be addressed. It is addressed in aviation. It's not addressed in railways. <clears throat> Railway parts, it seems like anybody can make anything. And uh, I've, I've talked to many uh, of these railways, and their answer is, well, we'll just buy a new CBTC system for $200 million. And, and that really shouldn't be the only answer. So I'll only put these few words here to tell you a little story. So uh, th there's a, a, uh, a light rail, grade-separated passenger railway system that uh, I'm familiar with. Our company designed the railway signal system in the 90s before I, I was there, but I, I've always been very familiar with the system. It's a cab signal speed control system that's with manual driving. So the, when the train is over speed, as would happen when you're going at top speed and then there's a step down in the speed commands, so you're immediately over speed, the, after six seconds, it goes into a penalty brake to a full stop, unless the operator puts the brakes on. And we call that suppression because the operator suppresses the imposition of the penalty brake application. The amount of braking is measured by a transducer in a brake valve, or in a brake pipe, brake tank, air brake system that converts air pressure to electricity and is measured by some type of processor. The, recently, there was an accident last year. A train ran into the bumping post at the end of the line. And I'm like, well, how did that happen? And uh, while the, the uh, value of the pressure transducer drifted over time, over decades, such that when the operator put the brakes on, pulled the handle back to get the brakes on, the light that comes on and tell him he has suppression. 
And, that's, and he would stop there because he has suppression. But the amount of brake he was putting on to get suppression was insufficient to meet the safe braking standards. The issue is that that pressure transducer, you can't put it out there and think it's going to last for 50 years. There's a, a very close parallel in, in all aircraft, including mine, there is a pitot tube and air pressure comes into the pitot tube and it's used to measure airspeed, which is very critical, especially when you're landing. And uh, the transducer that measures that airspeed and displays it on my panel is required to be calibrated and certified every two years. In railways, it goes 25 years, who knows how long, and it's never even measured. So we could learn a lesson. Optimization is uh, interesting. <clears throat> the uh, railways have uh, high capacity urban metros uh, and complete automation is required for the closest headway. Aviation, it's interesting, uh, when they want to get the maximum number of airplanes into uh, an airport, they throw away all the automation and they just train everybody to, uh, uh, to do a very complicated dance. High altitude operation, this is where the jet airplane is most efficient. Uh, automation uh, <clears throat> is required the most. There's no parallel in railways. Medical factors uh, are very interesting. Uh, airplanes have two pilots, generally, the big airplanes, but not always. Uh, trains have a single pilot, but yet aviation has a, a three-tiered medical certification system that uh, is very strenuous. Every uh, pilot has to go to a doctor that's certified by the FAA to evaluate him for uh, operating that train. Train operators, not much. Sleep apnea is a problem in both industries. Shift work is a problem in both industries. Hours of service is, uh, has a very close parallel and is limited in both industries. Alcohol and drugs are forbidden in both industries. <clears throat> but the area that railways could improve is with uh, medical uh, checkups of other operators. We don't know how many of them, but there has been some accidents. Uh, I know of a couple of them recently where uh, the train operator had sleep apnea problems and caused an accident. It actually does happen. Safety certification is uh, very interesting. Era, early railway signaling, including when I started this industry, had no such thing. In the U.S., formal uh, aviation safety certification uh, started really with the space program in the 1960s. Today, it's highly regulated and complex. Safety certification in railways, by comparison, in the U.S. is in its infancy, although Europe is much far advanced at this than the U.S. Railways could learn from aviation. Summary. <clears throat> Initial training. Uh, new ATO system or a new line should use more sophisticated uh, simulators. And on ATO systems, recurrent training on manual scenarios uh, really is required and, and has to happen. Maintenance standards uh, in railways, I think, are quite sloppy compared to aviation. The uh, standards should be established by the manufacturer. And in aviation, for example, if, if Boeing builds an airplane, they might say, well, you've got to replace that engine every 5,000 hours. And uh, the airline, after a year or so, could say, or five years, could say, you know, we've been finding that we replace the engine in 5,000 hours, we take it apart, it's in perfect condition, why don't we make it 6,000? FAA will agree. So uh, there is some back and forth. Safety certification comparisons uh, between the two industries need more study. Parts manufacturing approvals should be definitely tightened for uh, passenger railway ATO systems. I think that's it. Questions? <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Michael, for your talk, full of wisdom. I think I could have listened for another hour. It was <laughs> really exciting. And uh, before we start with the questions, I think we have a little time. I would like to relate an experience which I will never forget in my early, very early career. 
it was at the time when you still could ask uh, to have a quick chat with the pilot during the flight. That's a long time ago, isn't it? And so I flew from Stuttgart to Vienna and I asked whether I could have a quick look to the cockpit. And I said to the pilot, I, you know, I'm from the competition, I'm from railway. And then he said, oh, I never use railways. I don't trust the safety of them. <laughs> and so he invited me to uh, have uh, the third seat in that cockpit to, to actually experience the approach and the landing. And then uh, somewhere when we, at some point when we were approaching the airport of Vienna, he started to correct the altitude, not by 10 meters or so, but very generously by hundreds of feet. And I mean, I was thinking, Hey man, he even doesn't know at which altitude he's flying, so uh, that was a bit of a shock. And um, another quick remark regarding what you said about safety approvals. I can uh, support this uh, because I have been uh, to a maker of airplanes in Switzerland. We don't make cars, but aircrafts. Pilatus aircraft is sold all over the world and my son is interested in an apprenticeship with them so we talked to the guy there about replacing uh, uh, aluminium parts uh, by fiber, carbon fiber parts in the future and uh, you know the, the story he told me about getting a, an approval for a new a part of the aircraft sounded very familiar with getting a safety approval for a signaling system. And so let's start the questions. Uh, we will uh, take questions alternatively from the audience here and from the live stream. And I would like to remind the participants to the live stream that we are not taking any anonymous questions, but please state your name and affiliation in your question. So we start with the audience here. First question, please. I'm from the vanity of hand salvation. Hello. Yes. See, unless uh, you may have to uh, study, the overall safety of such an operation is based on the safety level when you have the automatic operation plus the manual operation. Now, to improve the proficiency, you will have or you will need enough manual operating time. Now, when you add the two safety levels, will it give an overall higher safety figure which we need? I don't know of any studies, uh, but my experience is that uh, in railways there have been uh, accidents occurred when they go to manual operation and, and then some things uh, happen which the driver didn't, didn't expect. The, I don't think that the answer is to tell railway operators to drive the trains manually every day. Uh, I think the answer is to tell them to leave it on ATO all the time and get their manual experience uh, in a simulator. And, and in a simulator, we, we can do things that, that we can't do uh, in, in the real world. In an aircraft uh, simulator, which I've been in, 
uh, we have uh, the aircraft starting on fire or, you know, an engine quits every three minutes or, you know, all this kind of stuff. In, in railways, we should have scenarios where uh, uh, it fails and you have to take over manual control and then you have to navigate some complex interlock and, 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 and uh, things that you wouldn't put the passengers at risk to try and do this. Uh, but but uh, you, in a simulator, you can do all kinds of things. And so I think that better simulators is, is an important part of improving safety. Do we, do we have a question from the net? Okay, so all the participants uh, on the live stream are very welcome to ask questions. But we, we are now taking the next question from the room. I'm Charles Page from Siemens. Um, a fundamental difference between rail and, and um, aviation seems to be that uh, the, the whole concept of fail-safe in, in, in railways. You don't have that luxury in an aircraft. You can't just sort of abandon responsibility and leave the aircraft to its own devices. How, how do you feel about um, that concept of fail-safe in, in railways, how it's, it's changed the design of, of systems in aviation versus railways? And is it a concept that's probably now a bit naive, that we have to move on from that and uh, uh, take more responsibility more of the time, in, in even when we have failures? There's a request on the website. They, they're asking whether you could repeat the question before answering. It oh, sure. you're not getting clear from the other microphone. Okay. The question was, I'll paraphrase it. The, uh, <clears throat> in railways, we have what we call fail-safe. And in uh, avi aviation, we don't, ha we don't have the luxury of, of fail-safe. And and I believe the question was, maybe we should get away from the concept of fail-safe. Let me start out by saying that the words fail-safe mean different things to different people. I was talking to somebody once in the hospital business. And he said that their systems were fail-safe. And I'm like, well, what's that mean? And their idea of fail-safe is that the batteries keep everything running until the generator comes on and there's enough uh, a, a fuel in the generator to run it for the next three days. So uh, fail-safe is, is not something that's used in the aviation business. But really, in aviation, uh, we, fail <coughs> we fail operational. If you look at the uh, instrument panel of a modern aircraft, or even my aircraft, you think, geez, they get all these different instruments. You need all that to fly the airplane. And the answer is, uh, no, you don't. Most of them are just there for redundancy. You could take away 90% of them, you could fly the airplane. And uh, so we have a lot of, uh, in, in, in <clears throat> aviation, we have redundancy. And, and we have different ways of navigating, different ways of lowering the landing gear, different ways of doing everything, so that we always, uh, even though I have a single-engine airplane, it's got two ignition systems, it's got two fuel pumps, one's manual, one's uh, electric, it's got, uh, it, it, everything is redundant. And, and uh, so the words fail-safe are not even used. I think that we should get away from the concept of fail-safe in, in uh, <clears throat> railways because there's no such thing as fail-safe uh, I like to think about a highway grade crossing and, you know, we drop the gates and the flashers are flashing and we say, well, it failed safe. But the, uh, if the gates are down, eventually somebody's going to push them up and tie them with a rope and drive across the tracks because you can't stop the rest of the world. If, if a train in ATO, if something goes wrong and, and you say, well, it's fail safe, it's stopped on the tracks. But those people are not going to sit on that train until their hair grows gray. The train is going to move, and, and that movement is part of the overall uh, uh, 
safety situation. So, so uh, one way of saying this is there's no such thing as an unreliable safe system. And, and the safety analysis of a railway has to consider what happens when <coughs> uh, the so-called fail-safe event occurs. There really is no fail-safe. The train has to get to where it's going. I think this is very much in line what I have said this morning. Thank you for that. Um, one more question from the room. Uh, uh, you know, I think the, oh, there is one question over there. Yeah, my name is uh, David Peel from New South Wales. Um, it's a question relevant to both industries, really, and it's regarding the balance between self-certification and safety um, authorization from an independent perspective. So the question was the balance between safety certification and, and, uh, <coughs> and operation? Independent safety certification compared to self-certification by right. the manufacturer or supplier. <clears throat> yeah, ISA independent safety certification is compared to self-certification uh, by, by the supplier. In aviation, the uh, – <coughs> uh, that's a very good question, by the way. In, in aviation, the uh, Federal Aviation Administration in the U.S. and probably agencies around the world – would not trust the manufacturer to be uh, the sole determinant of, of the safety of the aircraft. For one thing, an independent uh, analysis is, is always called for. Interestingly, in aviation, they don't have this concept of a third party independent safety uh, thing. It's not done that way for some reason, but uh, that we have in railways. The, uh, but it actually is, is uh, something that in aviation is talked about a lot as airplanes become more complicated. Uh, it's more difficult for the FAA to hire some people and say, you go look at Boeing and tell me if it's safe because, uh, well, it's a complicated story. What are you going to read the software code? You know, they're not, how are they going to do that? So, so uh, increasingly, as a, a complexity is requiring uh, uh, more of the safety certification uh, to fall on the manufacturers, and there are people in the aviation business that are unhappy with that, and and uh, there is discussion currently about uh, what to do about that. And I think, in light of the recent accidents, there's going to be more. Uh, thinking uh, about that, because uh, in perspective, somebody could have looked at this and said, you're going to do what? You're going to have a, an autopilot that works when the autopilot is turned off? And uh, it, it just doesn't make sense, maybe. And so, so uh, <clears throat> it's a good question, and there's a lot of discussion about that. Uh, railways don't really have that much complexity, so, uh, but I think that an independent uh, Safety certification is important, and I don't think we should rely on, on uh, the supplier who has a financial incentive to simplify the certification process. A very interesting answer. Um, this may be uh, appearing impolite, but I also have a question which, <laughs> which I have to ask. Uh, it is also related what was said in the previous talk, and this is about the degree of automation which we should uh, achieve. I think there is a, a lot of controversy going on about this. Some people say everything should be fully automated from cars to trains to planes, so no human ever touches any button and what not anymore. And others say this is not possible, and so we should uh, deal with this very carefully. You hinted at it when saying what your opinion on your own autopilot was. Can you, very brief, otherwise Sundar will 
Uh, kill me just <laughs> two minutes. <clears throat> the, uh, <clears throat> and they got that question, right? The, uh, <clears throat> it's an interesting question. The, the, uh, from my own perspective, uh, everybody that's reading about this Boeing 737 now knows that, boy, this elevator trim is a really dangerous thing. The, uh, I've always known, most pilots have always known, that elevator trim is a very dangerous thing. The, uh, most airplanes, all the big airplanes, but most airplanes, even like mine, have electric elevator trim. Uh, mine doesn't. Uh, and, and it's that way in purpose. <laughs> I have to manually move a wheel. So, uh, and a big advantage is that I always know what it's doing because I did it. <laughs> and, and, uh, but uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> there is uh, a lot of talk ab about humans. In railways, uh, there is, a lot of talk about driverless trains, and I've actually worked on a, a system in Los Angeles that was proposed to be driverless, and they never really got there. And in the end, they said, well, we're gonna have somebody on the train anyway, because you know, what if somebody picks a fight with somebody else, or somebody tries to pry open the doors, or something stupid happens. And uh, so we gotta have a person on the train. And if we're gonna have a person on the train, well, we might as well have him sitting up front. And if he's sitting up front, why don't we just have him sit there and push buttons. Uh, so so that you say, well, why would you want to have a driver of this train if you've got to have a person on there anyway? And uh, maybe he just looks at tickets. But uh, So I personally don't believe that we should go to zero human involvement in these complex, complex systems. I don't believe that we should go to airlines with only one pilot, even though a lot of small airplane airlines operate with one pilot, and I think that's okay. But... Uh, the, uh, if you have 300 people sitting in the back, I don't know why you'd want to go to one, one pilot or no pilots. I think that's ridiculous. Uh, there's a lot of interest these days in uh, pilotless quadricopters that are going to carry people into downtown uh, city centers. Uh, I'm not getting into one of those. And uh, I, I don't know why you would want to not have somebody that understands the machinery and the system and the environment uh, to, with some training to have some advice. Thank you very much for this clear statement, and uh, please join me in thank. It's just in time. There's one question coming. Okay, but it is very close It's your to responsibility. That. Yep. Can it you is. read it out yeah, here? It so is. It, okay. it it is very close to what Michael was talking about now, but still I'll read it if he wants to add on. Railway signaling engineers have attempted to remove the human element through initially interlocking and now ATP systems. It seems many aircraft accidents are caused by human error. Is the industry trying to eliminate this? Well, it's very, very interesting to say that uh, aviation accidents are caused by human error. The, uh, in, in light of what's going on today in aviation, the, uh, but uh, I, I like to say that uh, the accidents are not caused by human error as much as they are caused by misunderstanding of the main machine interface, uh, which is really what, what this whole talk is about. The, uh, but it's how humans and, and machines interact. And with these recent a couple of accidents with, with the 737, you're gonna find out that uh, the problems uh, did not occur in the air you're going to find, everybody talks about, well, the angle of attack sensor uh, uh, failed. Well, I can tell you that an angle of attack sensor on a Boeing airplane doesn't just fail when it's two years old, so that didn't happen. Somebody on the ground damaged it. So, well, how did they damage it? Well, we don't know, but uh, I'm sure you're going to see as part of the airworthiness directive that's going to come out, there's going to be big signs on the side of the airplane saying, when the airplane's parked at the gate, stay away from this thing. You're also going to find that there's, uh, in, in my airplane world, where I, take, I have my own airplane, I take it to a mechanic to have him work on it, he 
he doesn't have any supervision. Most of them operate as, as sole proprietorship. And, and we always talk about, well, when an airplane comes out of maintenance, well, geez, you know, first flight is going to be day visual, uh, no passengers, you know, because, well, who knows what's wrong with it? Because we have maintenance-induced failures. So, uh, again, it's, it's man-machine interface. Uh, when work is done on it, it's not done correctly. And with these Boeing aircraft, you're going to find out that they replaced the angle of attack sensor, but they didn't uh, recalibrate it correctly, or they didn't, Boeing misunderstood or overestimated the qualifications of the people doing the work and didn't really uh, bring the, the description of what has to be done to, down to the lowest level. So, uh, and then, the, it's only when, when you get in the air, everybody likes to talk about it and say, well, a pilot should have done this and done that. But, but uh, I don't agree that aviation accidents are caused mostly by humans in this day and age. Uh, but uh, the, it's more about the combination of the uh, uh, pilots and the machine and the whole support structure. It's a big picture issue. Thank you very much, Michael. Please join me.